Hello, David. Hey, everyone. Hi, David. I don't know which link I was using, and I just thought, oh, funny, I'm finally the first one here. And then after a while, I began to, <laughs> began to suspect the more likely truth that indeed I was the only one messed up on the schedule. Hi, everyone. I had, I had trouble finding, but I got here somehow. Hey, and we have a lovely new friend here. Good to see you, unless you've been here on days I haven't been here, maybe. No. Okay. Well, wonderful to meet you. I'm David. I've, I've listened to two or three, and I've read the book very much skimming part five. I understand. Good. Good to meet you. What's your name? Di. Hi. Good to meet you, Di. Di as in princess, Shira as in sheep. Lovely. Di. <laughs> Great, Di. Good to meet you. Sorry I'm late, everybody. That's okay. We were just chatting, and uh, I, I've known Di for about a year and a half or so. Uh, we read The Ever-Present Origin by Jean mm-hmm. Gebser together, and cool. she's been on the forum all this time and uh, has, as she mentioned, listened to a few of our, our talks mm-hmm. and has been reading the book uh, along with us. She's been one of those invisible uh, observers, uh, lurkers, lurkers, <laughs> and <No. laughs> so so we've just been chatting and getting to know uh, one another. But I also have to say I need to leave in about one hour and five minutes time from now That's because true. I have another appointment. So Great. I'll dip out at that stage. Lovely. Well, that would be that would be pretty close to our ending time anyway. So Good. maybe we'll end blame to end around that time. And Di, I'm presuming from your lovely accent that you're from Chicago. Is that am I? <laughs> Adelaide, Australia. Hmm. <laughs> there we go. Now Bob's my uncle. <laughs> so we do have an Australian on, on the call, but she hasn't she hadn't heard of uh, Gregory David Roberts or of this mm-hmm. book or of his. Uh, of his case being, you know, an escapee and convict and so forth. Wow. I, I think I did know of it back in when it happened, mm-hmm. but I didn't attach the name and the memory. Mm. Sure. How interesting. Well, wonderful to, wonderful that you're here and uh, welcome you all the, all the Thanks. minutes that you can be here. That'd be great. So I had a thought about how we might structure the, the call today uh, since on the one hand, uh, it's the last call, and so we've finished the book, and we have the opportunity now to reflect upon it as a whole. Uh, and on the other hand, the, the actual page count for the reading this week was relatively shorter, smaller than previous weeks. In fact, we have only three chapters. Uh, perhaps what we could do is, much like we've done before, review those chapters one by one, but not take too much time in them. And in a sense, maybe they don't require that much time, uh, but review them nonetheless, kind of for, for closure on the, the kind of what of the, uh, of, of the story. And then leave the rest of the time for more open reflections on the larger themes and the, the, uh, the ideas that really he lands on uh, in, the, in the book. And our own organic responses uh, to, to what we've read in the last week as well as in the last nine weeks. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, if you're all in, are in agreement, I, uh, I think we could just get jump right in and spend, I don't know, no more than 10 minutes on each chapter, which would leave us a good 30 minutes, pl- 30 minutes plus or minus for meta-reflections. Cool. Sounds so, good. Who want, would, would anyone like to volunteer for a review of Chapter 40, just to kick us off on that? I could do 41 or 42, but um, I'd be happy to do, for example, 41. I, I can do 40. Yeah. Chapter 40 um, starts up with the makeup and the moral codes of the new council. And there's the description of the differences that are leading up to the conflict with uh, Chuha's gang. Is that how you say that word? Is it Chuha? Is that a word? That's how I read it. Mm -hmm. Um, And Abdullah uh, drives Lynn to see a surprise. 
and the surprise turns out to be Modena. Right. Lynn chases him down because he's sort of surreptitiously spying on the group, and then they have a conversation. And that by the end of that conversation, it changes Lynn's heart somewhat about his own feelings of responsibilities and his share of blame for things like his the failure of his marriage. And he mentions that wisdom, the kind of wisdom that arises from failure and clarity from sorrow. So I just sketched that out so we could delve more deeply into different points. Hmm. Well, there was something about uh, Modena's appearance, which was uh, quite uh, startling to, 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 um, to Lynn. Um, and uh, it, it, I mean, that's the first thing. He had to chase him down, right, too. So, so Modena is like lurking, <laughs> watching Lin uh, from the shadows, chases him all through the maze of the, the slum uh, and then uh, corners him. He can't escape. Uh, and it's a very sweet encounter, right? Isn't, I think, between them. There's, I mean, Lin is d- deeply disturbed by his, his appearance. His face has been slashed up. It's mutilated, essentially. He's become a kind of monster. Uh, and... Um, and yet what I guess is interesting about that encounter is that Modena is ho- hopeful for something, right? He's, he's been holding out hope that the woman that he loves, Ula, who had left him in tied up in bed, you know, where he had gotten slashed up by, by Mauricio, uh, and then ended up that, and then killed Mauricio and then fled uh, back to Germany. He's hopeful that she will return, uh, for him. And, you know, we later learn that she does, which is crazy. Um, <laughs> uh, but I totally that was, agree with uh, Lynn that she was never coming back. <laughs> I was like, no, she's not coming back. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's what I thought, too. I didn't think we'd hear back from her. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I thought it was just going to be a kind of tragic story. But um, it does, there is a way that things resolve themselves. For, for at least some some of the threads resolve themselves in the end. Um, so, what else about that? I mean, there there was also Tariq, just a little bit earlier, just to throw in. The, the, we learn he he enters the picture again, and we learn that he's kind of being groomed for uh, a role in the council. He's sort of the almost an inheritor of. Um, of Cotter's power, uh, but still too young to really to really wield it. Um, we learn about also Lin's at, like what Lin thinks of Chuha and his kind of attitude about what he said about him that he gives violent crime a bad name. I think right. um, Chuha, and, Chuha the rat, right? The rat, yes. Mm-hmm. Ashok Chandra Shekhar. That's the only time they use that name. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, these chapters felt like wrapping things up and the action wasn't quite, a, and the, with the exception of the next chapter and the, the, that final uh, violent encounter, the action is not that dramatic. And we're kind of, you know, just for a, to step back for one second, I almost didn't want to, read these chapters and I kind of put them off um, because I was afraid of being not disappointed per se, but uh, maybe of, of losing that, the sense, that magical sense of being in a world or the magical sense of being a, in a story. Yeah. And I guess that start like, as I started reading the, this chapter and the, ne- and the next two, uh, that feeling started kind of creeping into me and I almost resisted reading it. Uh, so I, I almost didn't take it as seriously, I think, as the earlier, earlier stuff. Um, just a reflection on that. What, one piece of the action in that chapter um, was the description in that dark alleyway where 
Lynn was having what you called a sweet encounter with Modena and the lighting of those, uh, I guess, beady little beady cigarettes and how the light displayed um, Modena's face and each other. And you, there's just something is almost like I wanted to see that somehow filmed, you know, with the, the flaring of the matches and the, and the revelation of the face and then the darkening and all that. Um, his description of that, I, I just found myself pouring over those uh, real art in that scene. I thought. Mm -hmm. I was also thinking um, there was this rhythm um, in, in the writing style where often either to open a chapter or to close a chapter, there would, he gave himself, the author gave himself a little bit more permission to, to wax poetic or profound or make some overarching simile. And I thought chapter 40, and, and when I talk about 41, I had noted specifically the beginnings of these, you know, chapter 40 is the word mafia comes from Sicilian word for bragging. But if you ask any serious man who commits serious crimes for a living, he'll tell you it just isn't that, you know, dot, 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 dot. And so that was very nice that the way that, you know, the plot line gets gets bookended with these moments of a pre pretty um, pretty deep and, and often novel reflections. Like I've really valued this. Mm -hmm. I think he's also bringing in these, uh, he, he's tying to get, he, he's bringing back a couple of themes, like philosophical themes that what I realized after it, like at the end, bring us right back to the very beginning of the book in, in a sense. And and the the return of Modena, for example, has something to do with the idea of fate and the relationship between fate and choice. Uh, this this is really uh, comes up much, I think, more prominently in the last chapter. But in uh, in, in chapter forty, uh, there's a line uh, that uh, comes from Scorpio George, one of the two astrological brothers or whoever they are um and it says fate always gives you two choices the one you should take and the one you do and it's it's kind of like a carla-esque type of uh right. you know, clever witticism um but i i underlined it because it, that fate thing ar ar arises with modena it arises again um when he's talking to carla at the end of the book and and it also has, it also comes back in kind of the takeaway from his conversation with Modena. Cause I mean, he doesn't really go too deep into it, but he acknowledges that something in him changes at this point. And it's like, I want to find it because I, I, uh, you referenced it, Paul, this idea that Modena had accepted his role or his share in the res of responsibility. I and uh right. so modena, so what ha actually so what happens modena has the story wrong he thinks that lynn has killed mauricio when it wasn't lynn it was ula and lynn doesn't want to want to tell him the truth uh and then he says that silence is silence could be a you know a kind of way of telling the truth is what he says and I was like okay um, I get that um, but then he has this sense that I'm looking at the text right now just to find like the choice quote or something but he says and maybe he's right uh, maybe his way of remembering Maurice and Ula was right he kind of gives him he doesn't know the Although it's not factual, it's it's right in some other way. Um, I'm going to read just this this uh, line here or this paragraph here. Uh, Certainly, he dealt with the pain they'd caused him a lot better than I dealt with that kind of pain when it had happened to me. When my marriage fell apart in betrayal and bitterness, I became a junkie. I couldn't bear it that love was broken and that happiness had cindered so suddenly into sorrow. So I ruined my life and hurt a lot of people on the long way down. Modena, instead, had worked and saved and waited for love to return. And thinking about that, how he 
how he'd lived with what he had, had been done to him. And wondering at it on the long walk back to Abdullah and the others, I discovered something that I should have known, as Modena did right from the start. It was something simple, so simple that it took a pain as great as Modena's to shake me into seeing it. He'd been able to deal with that pain because he'd accepted his own part in causing it. I'd never accepted my share of responsibility right up to that moment for the way my marriage had failed or for the heartache that had followed it. That was why I'd never dealt with it. And then, he t- then in the next par- paragraph, he says that he, ex- like in that moment, ex- accepted the blame. And I guess that kind of leads us into the next two chapters and leads David into that philosophical and sort of waxing poetic kind of closing in the, in the, um, in the final paragraph of chapter 40. Um, I don't know. It's just one of those profound truths that I, I don't, I can't, I don't have a particular way to um, process it right now. Other, other than that, uh, because I haven't seen that actually he has quite like he's saying that he accepted that pain or accepted that responsibility, but the, then the book ends and he's still a gangster and he's still uh, like he, he hasn't yet resolved, you know, his situation as far as we know, like from at least from what we know of his life as a whole. So, um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 um, I, I resonated with that particular passage though, because like when I think about, you know, things that I've been, things in my own life where I've felt things have gone wrong or that, uh, I share some, res- like that I, I, I share some responsibility in them. And so long as you don't tell that story, like of your own responsibility or your own role in a situation, it continues to be something that like kind of hangs over you or that haunts you some way that continues to be like, continues to affect you, continues to hold sway over your, over your life. And you guys are just staring at me and I feel, I feel like I'm going off into some, into some dark into some dark wood uh, but I'm trying to kind of get some meaning out of, out of like I'm trying I'm trying to connect that situation with with um, uh, with Modena with that other prisoner that he he, he met in in, uh, in the you know when, when he was uh, incarcerated uh, oh, excuse me not the other prisoner but the one the one from the slum who went back who, who went to prison and then to the end of the to the end of the book and the reflections on on fate, um, and I, I don't know. I mean, maybe there's a connection there between even the whole process of writing this book. Like, why was it important to write this damn book? You know, like well, he suffered 13 years. If you read in the afterward to continue to to finish the book, two drafts of it that were uh, lost, and was it all to articulate his own role in in the pain that 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 has been caused i don't know i'm just just throwing out some ideas (laughs) what do you think well i think um we're gonna go to the next couple chapters and then i'll come back and meta communicate about the three yeah okay well that's that sound that sounds good great um, so chapter 41 begins uh, like this. Money stinks. A stack of new money smells of ink and acid and bleach like the fingerprinting room city in the police station. Old money, vexed with hope and coveting, smells, like sta- smells stale like dead flowers kept too long between the pages of a cheap novel. <laughs> and it goes on and on and on and then uh i love money to be once said to me but i hate the smell of it the more happiness i get from it the more thoroughly i have to wash my hands afterwards <laughs> which is a perfect setup for um 
kind of, you know, I mean, he, he's made this rise in the mafia, right? And um, but you get the sense that, you know, because of the way he's repositioned his relationship, he's not making like an ultimate power move. And there's some really rich reflections on acknowledging where he fits and where he can never fit as a Goya. So, um, Goya. Um, so, um, but 41 gets moving that way. You know, there's the, um, there's the wedding of, of Rajabai's daughter. Right. And, um, he bumps into DDA who has this new, you know, infatuation with this Italian man. Um, Lynn um, has to deal with sort of the, if not the emotional insult, the reality check of bumping into Carla's new boyfriend, Ranjit, and discovering that he's pretty, pretty hard not to like the guy and um, sort of another nail in the coffin for any of us who are hoping that he and Carla would finally get their shit together. <laughs> So uh, anyway, it was a nail in the coffin for me. I'm I'm surrendered now. We don't have, we don't have enough chapters left to give me the Holly, Hollywood ending that you know my white middle class upbringing has taught me to long for in in uh, pop music and in uh, movies. But um, so um, but then of course that's that little bit of intrigue where you, you know DDA. Uh, is going to travel and, and Lynn recommends the Georges. And so the richness of the character study keeps feeding and I don't want this book to end. I mean, I'm just sort of like, you know, hoping that, you know, this return to Bombay and, and kind of the, the um, getting back into these really juicy narratives about people's lives and everything. I just wanted to, to for it to just kind of, you know, I wanted it to be a 10 book, you know, crazy series or something, but so it's all bittersweet, you know, knowing how few pages you're holding at this point. Um, uh, and then of course, you know, uh, almost as if the talk of the Georges, uh, you know, and working out this, uh, this house watching situation gets us into this, gets the writer into this lighthearted mood. We get yet another Kano the Dancing Bear story. <laughs> no need to get him out of prison this time. That was, we've already done that one, but somehow he's in trouble again and we've got to get him to the edge of the city, which just is just incredible. So, you know, I, 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 I don't know. How. You know, what's funny though is yeah. Kano is an escapee just like Lynn. <laughs> That's the, bear itself, the bear himself escaped from prison. Uh, <laughs> When I guess his ha- his handlers are being mistreated, right, uh, right, 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 right. Oh God! I, so then, I just yeah. love the image of him having the Ganesha head on, and this like real being inhabiting <laughs> Ganesha going through the streets. How freaky that must oh, oh, look for just, everybody! Can just I love what, that image. <laughs> it, it just seemed it it struck that edge of just the um the the edge of what you could pass uh, uh, of like credulity, you know, and still so humorous. And, and in India, you know, it's a perfect backdrop for the anything is possible. Believe me, whether you, you know it from novels and movies or you've been there, it's just like, Oh yeah, no, no, this is, I can imagine this going down that way. Um, hmm. So of course, you know, the way the, the, you know, the, the peaks and valleys run in the, in the, uh, in the drama from light to heaviest, all of a sudden we're, we're back in mafia land, right? Chula's entire mafia is going to be gathering at one location. And there's a chance, you know, um, to support Abdullah in his revenge um, itinerary with this particular group. So, you know, there's the whole, you know, setup, you know, arriving to, to the zone, you know, um, who was it? There was the they meet Mah- Mahmud, right? And and then um, well, so they deal with this pre-attack, and then once they actually get into the to the house or complex where this is going on, they realize it's basically over, and uh, Chula's men have been completely wiped out. But they lost two men, you know, and one of whom was, you know, I think Solomon was like now like the last council member or something at that point. So Solomon is lost, um, and he was sort of, you know the last cut or buy sort of, you know, high council relation. And, and um, unless I missed anything in my notes, I didn't open up Kindle again here, but I think that's kind of how the chapter ends. Kind of scroll to it, but I, I do think that's it. Well, there's yeah. a connect. There's a Sapna connection as well. It was like the last remaining oh. uh, connection with Sapna and the, there was a Iranian Sapna con- connection so mm. it was Abdullah getting revenge and taking out the uh, yep. 
Iranian spies, but then it was also, I guess, putting an end to that whole matter uh, with with Sapna. Yeah, right. Well and, done. Yeah. Definitely. And yeah, Sal- and Salman is dead. Uh, and this then opens up to the next chapter, I believe. I think it comes in the next chapter when really it's a, it's a new generation, right? Of the, of the mafia council, right? The, and there's almost like, what's the, we don't really know the point anymore. It seems like Lynn doesn't know the point of why he's doing it. And that's the subtext here is he's got this, he's got a good life. He's got money, the, the power, they can walk the streets. They can kind of strut the streets. They wear the best clothes. They are respected, feared, uh, but it all seems empty. He doesn't seem to love yeah. it. It doesn't. Um, yeah, he, he, he seems to be still, search, you know, still lost in a way. It's still lost in, in his fate. It's still lost in his life. Uh, he also is a very relationship-driven guy, and you know, with. Carterby gone and Carla out of it, you know, just all the people he was connected to are more, it's more attenuated, you know, and especially within the mafia gang. You know, mm-hmm. Abdul, I guess, is the only one he still is really committed to and close to. And Abdullah has to leave anyway uh, now. He's right. not allowed in the city anymore. The police, are, you know, not going to tolerate him. So, there is some there is some turnover, uh, and should we move on to the to the next chapter? I want to go meta. Uh, okay, yeah. uh, let, let's let's get through this. Um, David, you're muted right now. <laughs> I said I thought you I thought you had done it already because you're halfway through forty two actually. Oh, oops! <laughs> but, but I feel your passion for the meta. Should we? Um, no matter who does it, let's. There's there are some juicy details to so just at least pull it out. Forty-two. I'll try. Uh, well, it begins with paying respects to the dead from this last attack, mm-hmm. and that's where we get the uh, the new lineup, uh, and we also get an apology from Andrew, who had challenged Lynn before that attack. Uh, and it turns into a semi-comical thing because he doesn't apologize for. Uh, <laughs> you know, dismissing him as a as a we agora agora like he got angry because he was gonna because lynn was gonna get to go on the mission but andrew had to take Tariq and chaperone Tariq back as a babysitter uh so andrew is one of the other uh agora uh, guna gundas uh and he apologizes for uh, cursing his mother right calling him a you know this and that effort and um and then uh he ends up in Nariman point which i guess geographically is on the water there and it's a it's been the scene of a, f- a few important encounters during the book but here he spots carla and they have their la- last conversation of the book and we learn from carla a few things i mean this sort of wraps up a, a bit more of her story uh, we learn from her. One interesting thing is that Khaled is alive. Khaled, the one who <clears throat> killed Habib and walked off without any arms. Or I'm sorry. Yep. Uh, and ha- he has, he's apparently walked back from Afghanistan and has become a spiritual teacher. Mm-hmm. So I'm v- I'm v- very interested to to see how Khaled has transformed. We don't end up uh, meeting him in this book yeah. uh, or meeting his re his revenant, his come, his return, returned self. Uh, we learn that, Car- that Carla was the one who set fire to Madame Ju's uh, palace. Uh, and she, I guess, contracted Abdul Ghani to do it. We learn also that Carla was the one who invented Sapna. So it was her idea to create a common enemy that they could use as a decoy uh, f- for the purposes of smuggling uh, guns and uh, other supplies into, out of India. Uh, and we learned that Ula has returned, indeed, and that uh, she and 
Modena are back together in some way. Carla has seen them and she was laying in, on his head, on his laying in bed together, laying somehow like they were in the same space kind of intimately. Uh, and, and then we get back into some of the, uh, some of Carla's reflections and a, a confession from her. One, one of the confessions is that she was longing for go. She was longing for that time that they had together. She, that the, that there, there was something that she, I get all almost admits like was gave her hope or gave her some sense of, um, she doesn't say it, you know, some sense of hope for love or something like that. Um, but then she confesses also that she is cold inside that, that she, she has left, uh, she left Qatar by, she left that, that scene because she stopped caring, uh, even about the atrocities, even for example, when Qatar by had Majid, uh, killed or allowed him to be killed in this Sapna scheme. Uh, what bothered her was not that he did it, but that she didn't feel anything about it. And that not feeling, that kind of coldness is, uh, uh, it seems to be like a curse or something. Like, like she, can't, she can't transcend it. And around that moment, something shifts in Lynn as well. And he he realizes that he doesn't like, he doesn't feel a stickiness or an attachment anymore to, to Carla. He says that he feels free. And that was very interesting, I I guess. I mean, I'd love to talk about that and kind of how, you know, when you're complete, like with, with somebody and how it was that, you know, we've come back from that initial infatuation when they first meet soon after, Lynn has arrived in Bombay to this final, at least at this point in the book, at this point in the story, I know it may go on in the next book, but um, to this uh, almost di- disillusionment perhaps uh, that, that occurs. And he, he, it's not, it's not a joyful freedom. It seems it's not like an elation. It's just a not, a not feeling, not that, not, not, not feeling stuck anymore uh, on her. It seems. Uh, the last thing we learn, uh, two more, more things in this chapter. One is that Qadabai has a spiritual teacher whose name is Idris, and Carla wants to go and see him. I think he's in, he's in another town, Delhi perhaps, or some, somewhere else. He's uh, in the mountains, isn't he? The mountains? Okay, yeah. Which makes uh, me think the sequel might have something to do with that. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> anyway, maybe not, but that's where my head is. Um, we all, and I should, and last one piece we missed is that Abdullah, uh, recruits Lynn to go on this final mission oh. to Sri Lanka. Wow. Uh, and, and this is essentially Cotter final wish, uh, that they bring, uh, supplies and, and, and weapons to the Muslim Tamil Muslims in, in the Sri Lankan civil war. Uh, so, so he's going to do that before he goes and sees the spiritual teacher. He tells, uh, he tells Carla. And then the, the final s- scene is, um, he's leaving, he's leaving his encounter with Carla and, and he walks into the slum and, and meets his friends there. Uh, and Prabhakar's parents are there as well. And we meet Prabha's baby. Uh, and, and he's dumb. He's, uh, flabbergasted because the smile on this baby, the, he, the baby is a likeness of, of Prabha, Prabhagar. And then, and then we get his final reflections at the end of the book. Uh, so I think that covers everything. And that, that's actually just about within our time frame as well. So we have half an hour to go meta. There was also a moment when Johnny Cigar tells him that he's he feels like he's hurt, let him down as a friend, that he didn't go and help him when he was offered the job to to then sort of get him out of that mess. Mm. Yeah. That's right. Anyway, that struck me. One other 
item struck me too is that when Lynn walks back into the slum, sort of just on automatic, he encounters Mukesh, who um, he insisted be freed from prison right. and Cotter got him out. And um, the Sapna thing comes up again, because even though we've come to believe that all the killers have been right. eliminated, he's going to some meeting because uh, I guess they're going to go teach those Muslims who's actually boss in Bombay. And so there's something about that, like something has created it, had a life of its own. But that was another interesting theme in the book. I thought the reason for that was that the the story that had been put out was that Abdullah was Sapna, remember? Uh, and that's why the police killed him. And so I, I thought that Mukesh just had the story wrong. Like he just didn't know the facts. And Lynn knew the inside story and knew that Sapna was a fabrication. But like the word on the street was a totally different version that was more favorable to uh, the, the gang's in, uh, objectives. But what, I, what interested, interested me about that encounter was that he doesn't correct him. And it's the second time that somebody has a false story that he doesn't correct. And now that we're talking about it, I realize that maybe the reason for that is that he is that the story is that the story becomes not important anymore in some way. And almost as part of this ending movement, he's kind of letting go of, sto- of some stories and he's not finding it necessary to like to engage them or to renegotiate them, even if they're not quite right. Uh, and perhaps he's sort of preparing to reflect on his own stories Maybe his relationship with Carla as one or his feelings of, uh, of betrayal toward, toward Kaderbai or, you know, so, uh, so many uh, these other things in his life that have, that he, you know, that have not resolved in some way. Uh, perhaps he's coming to this point where he can sort of let them be uh, what they are or what they appear to be. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, that, that, and maybe he's preparing the reader as well to <laughs> let go of the story. There definitely was a feeling of letting go through these last chapters. There was, I don't know. I mean, frankly, I felt they were flatter. And maybe I was used to so much drama that I was sort of disappointed at the end. It didn't have the kind of power and juice that so much of the earlier book had had for me. So I felt by the end a bit kind of disappointed, might be a bit deflated. Like mm. um, it may be that I got desensitized <laughs> by all the intensity of the earlier chapters. I don't know. So it's actually helpful going back through this because it's making it richer for me than I was sort of, having it be for me towards the end. I yeah, I, I felt the, the uh, same. Oh, sorry. Um, Please go ahead, Beth. It got, it got to be just more ugly description. And um, I when you were going meta, Marco, on the comments on Chapter 40, before we came back to 41, 42, I was on mute, but I was saying here to me... Um, the author is um, the, uh, an expert in description of the inner landscape of his life, and the um, the the famous or the the most popular highlight from chapter forty sums that up. I can't give you a page number because I don't know how to do that from Kindle, but. The cloak of the past is cut from patches of feeling and sewn with rabus threads. Most of the time, we best we can do is wrap it around ourselves for comfort or drag it behind us as we struggle to go on. But everything has its cause and its meaning. Every life, every love, every action and feeling and thought has its reason and significance, its beginning and the part it plays in the end. And I think that for me, sums up why he's writing the book. It's about it's about getting into articulation 
that inner landscape of his through the various contexts. And my disappointment was, of course, it doesn't all doesn't all finish. <laughs> Some of it finishes, and 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 listening to you this morning helps me to understand that better. But um, somewhere in the comments about the book is is it actually uh, a novel about the events and the drama, or is it a a novel about the philosophy of good and evil? And and I think you know that's it's clearly both. But for me, the interest is in these really passionate turns of phrase and and metaphorical use of, you know, things that really enrich your reading as you go. And I was also disappointed because I had to skim so quickly just to be part of today's conversation. So, But I don't think I'll go back and reread them, I think. <laughs> wow. <laughs> nice. You know, I, I underlined that same passage, actually, the cloak of the past. And uh, it was a beautiful passage. I, 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 um, I wonder how it has to do with fate and with this sense that every episode, every character, every conver- it's leading to something or it's, it's, part of a, it's part of a larger story or a larger unfolding that you're somehow moving towards towards your fate but that within yeah. that there's some you have a choice or you haven't you have the ability you have a universe of possibilities is what cutter by uh, says every every human heartbeat is a universe of possibilities yeah. and and, and, the, and the popular highlight from chapter 41 gets that in two lines the only kingdom that makes any man a king is the kingdom of his own soul the only power that has any real meaning is the power to better the world. So it's a novel about crime and squalor and, and murder and war and, and yet it's about his dance in terms of his own bettering of the world as I read it. I mean, I feel like, I mean, one strain of it, it is a journey of a man um, moving from a fall to kind of beginning to climb out of the fall and begin to learn how to take responsibility. Um, you, you know, you just get that sense because, I mean, those two startling moments when he sees that guy want to stay in prison and he's at peace with it, that was so powerful for him, in part because, of course, he didn't, you know, he he ran away. He couldn't do it. And then again, it gets reiterated, you know, in these chapters with, um, I guess, with Modena, right, who, who is at peace with what happened, despite this incredible disfigurement. Um, because, again, he takes responsibility. So anyway, that, to me, that's one of the, the threads that moves through the whole thing. The other thing... The thing that I, I was touched by in the last part was going back to the slum and the sense of love there and and connection and community. Um, uh, it was like that's like where his heart is or something, you know. And, uh, and it was interesting to read that that's where he's, at least at the end of the book, after jail and everything, that's where he's living is in Bombay. I thought that was interesting too. I was glad that he ended there. I was, it, it was a, a bittersweet, I think, uh, moment because of who's not there. Prabhakar is not there and J- Jitendra's wife is not there. And, uh, and so there's that palpable, I think, shadow, that palpable sense of loss of, of, the, of the absence there. Uh, but there is, a, there is a hope, right? Because that, you there there's a child yeah. and it's Pra Prabhakar's child and he's got this amazing amazing smile. Uh and like I think you're saying like you said, there's this a sense of community, a sense of trust, a sense of um purity of heart, maybe. Uh, yeah. and he has a place to stay. He could he could stay there if he, he they offer him a place uh, on the 
on the floor one of the huts his old hut is still available actually uh so maybe that that is what ends up happening i don't know in the subsequent books well, and the last it. three lines are brilliant we live on <laughs> last three words i'm sorry yeah i was only going to say uh paul is this is this your i forget in this jazz piece whether this is your bass solo or whether i'm supposed to grab the next 16 bars for my sax number but um kind of exactly on what Di just said for me one of the major um reflections at the close for me is how he used this tension between novel and memoir, or maybe the way that he left us all hanging mm. between um, the conventions or the powers of the novel and the extra power or credence it has because it suggests the power of actual historical <laughs> truth that, that, that sort of being strung in, in that, in that balance, I was mesmerized by the fact that from the standpoint, had it been only a memoir, it would bear sort of the burden um, and sometimes the lifelessness just in its pure kind of, you know, dead accuracy of, of being true to history, whereas the novel gives him power to identify aspects of experience uh, and bring them even more to life through the development of side plots and extra making characters extra rich or, or whatever. So I know that that tension worked for me and that by the end, of, by the end of the novel, you know, almost like almost in the, um, in, in the, in the incompletion of all of it. Um, I was reflecting on how, and we've gone into this a few times in this group, you know, well, you know, what's the truth about our own life stories versus the story we make of them to make sense of this, you know, overwhelming experience um, that, that, that is life, but um, kind of hanging, hanging in this kind of tension between the two, you, you look at something like um, uh, um, Roberts, the novelist puts words in, in cutter mouth, like basically creates cutter but Cutter by actually determined the fate of Lynn, drew him to war. And so there's these incredible tumbling interlinked circles of co-authorship. And I was just marveling at the, the, the dialogue or dialectic between created characters affecting, you know, Lynn Roberts, Roberts Lynn. And so anyway, I, I, I found that thrilling. And the, the, it, the way that it closed, and I totally hear what other people are saying. It, it betrays a certain, you know, rhythm and expectation of you know dramatic poignancy in a certain moment but um i found it just sort of it came um it came the way that life does it did it did little sort of mini coming to circles even while respecting the fact that there that i think um maturity in art and maturity in being human means making a certain kind of peace with with the incompleteness you know, that's so convenient, you know, the conventions of completeness. Um, it leaves a lot open, which, um, which I found there was space to breathe and own my own version of the story and, and kind of let all these, like you guys were just saying, I felt each of you in different ways was saying that one of the themes here is, is cycles, reincarnations. We, you know, a Prabhaka is gone, but here's Prabhaka's baby. And Lynn cycled and cycled. We meet him as a we meet him as a, a thief and a you know someone who deserves to be in prison, and then we come to to love him and hope for him, and he redeems our hope in some moments, and then he you know so yeah, this is it's a sort of my riff on on where I was left at the end. One of the other things that struck me was that he very early in the book he takes Limbaba as the very appropriate name for himself. And by flipping back to that early reference, most of the book is just called Lin, but Lin Baba seems to seems to come back into view. And in a way, he's found an identity through all of this text, you know, through living it, but also through writing it. And it's no surprise to me that he goes back to Bombay to live. Mm. 
he also returns in the end to the conversation with Prabha's parents, uh, who are the ones who gave him the, the name Shantaram uh, as right. sort of his spiritual name. That was like a shock when that word came back. I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, keep going. No, that's it. Uh, it's this, uh, this idea of like the cycles and of identity, finding, a, finding an identity. Uh, he, he does create an identity here. And like there are all these ways that people – know him for for the things that he's done know him for working in the slums for working in the cholera epidemic for going to war for being you know a, a gunda or a mafioso but they know him also for his heart they know him for, as somebody that that loves people ultimately and i think you were, you were saying this earlier pam that he's he's a he's a relationship driven uh person like he's not there for the the grand cause or the ideal he's there for the people and i th- i think it's appropriate that he ends there like with the people that kind of know his heart you know the best in some way you know like know it know it well enough to name him even um, and he's and he says this at the beginning of part four in chapter 30 personality and personal identity are in some ways like coordinates on the street map drawn by our intersecting relationships we know who we are and we define what we are by references to the people we love and our reasons for loving them. I think that's a choice quote. Hmm. Well, that's a great, great quote to bring back into it. Thank you. That's great. I want to hear Paul's bass solo. 16 bars. <laughs> the end. Well, I was anticipating our talk today with um, a kind of tenderness of heart because I've so enjoyed our meetings. So I want to share that. Um, And talking together has deepened my experience of the book. And I've been aware that at different times of my life, I might have paid attention to um, some of the different things that the book means. And I also noticed that the book means a lot of things at the same time. There's so many rich, powerful threads and streams. Um, These last three chapters, actually, um, I found very powerful. And the pacing of them seemed like watching um, some foreign films, um, where everything is so much slower, it seems, than a lot of American movies and the actual um, emotions are explicated and there's complete dialogue going back and forth instead of sort of the assumed or the hidden and <clears throat> it allowed me to sink in. And so at this time in my life, I'm being drawn along particularly, I think, by the uh, themes of love and then responsibility for mistakes made, especially in past relationship and um reading that final conversation with Carla was um, so powerful. I read it last Sunday and then I went back and realized I needed to reread it again because there was so much in it. And then to get ready for today's talk, I just had to go through it one more time because it had such a tenderizing effect on my emotional body. Um, So the, um, the impact of the, at the end as it slowed down and the, and the themes for whatever reason resonated strongly. Um, and one little piece, the beginning of 41, he's talking about, Oh, now he's no, he belongs because he's been invited to the wedding. And Mm -hmm. then he just sort of walks into that family scene in the slum. And, um, even though it was, it also seemed to me that, um, wow, this is, great cliffhangers for a sequel on certain levels that um, that that was um, sweet. And I was appreciative of the fact that he was sort of in the arms in the, in the loving and playful arms of that new family. And that in both of his lives with the mafia, as well as with, um, you know, the, the, the slum dwellers and Prabhakar's family, he had a feeling of belonging.
Yeah. That was a sad com. I'll just to riff on what you. The, it was a sad conversation. I thought at the end bet- between Lynn and Carla, and what I found. I mean, I read. I read it a couple of times as well, and what I found sad about it was that Carla could only say, "I like you." He, he returns to the same question that he asked her. Um, when they were, when he was recuperating uh, from his heroin addiction, they were before he, before going off to to war uh, that last time, uh, and she can't, she can't, she can't say it because it's, she can't feel it, right? It's not true for her. That's why she won't say it. Uh, but she, it, so, so the most she can offer is her liking. Uh, which is weak is weak tea. It's lame. You know, you don't, it's what you, nobody wants to hear. Like, I don't love you, but I like you. Uh, everybody wants to be loved. Not even if they're not liked, they'd rather, right. So, so much more of a profound uh, feeling and kind of relationship. I'm really, you know what I would love? I want to read Carla's version of this story. That I thought would be really interesting there's so much of her and there's so much that he remembers of, of her or invents whatever, as the case may be. Uh, but her point of view, I imagine could be as profound as Lynn's and, uh, and probably just as well-written as well. If, if she's as good as he portrays her as being. She, I don't know. I mean, she seems like she's just still really broken, you know, that she can't get any further than like that, mm. that, you know, she's numb. Um, so I wonder, actually, I mean, she's known for coming up with these clever, witty, crafted sayings, but I, I wonder how much depth there would be because I don't know how much she can access. Mm. Anyway. And- and just for the variety on her, I absolutely disliked her as a woman in the story. I felt no erotic uh, sympathy with his attention to her, regardless of how he lavished authorship, generosity on her. Huh. I, I, I would, she would be my anti, anti woman to pursue. Wow. I don't like the lofty, the superior, the aloof, the cold, the, the whole thing. Just like she. I, re- I had to work to distinguish that the difference between I, I, she's not a sympathetic character to me, but he may have well developed her. Cause at first my feeling was like, Oh man, he's just not nailing Carla. I, I don't get her. I don't get why he likes her. I don't, you know? So anyway, I struggled with her just to chime in. Wow. That's fascinating. Yeah. Why do you think he was so enamored of her? Yeah. I, you know, I but struggled. you know, we get these fixations. And, and we imbue them with so much power. And it's a driving force to the whole book. So, yeah, I mean, the ending in that sense is and that he finally gets free of that powerful, powerful thing, which I'm sure nobody here has ever felt for anybody, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and it's a mystery, right, anyway, <laughs> why and how it evolves for certain people. He does mention that... Um, she no longer holds power over him. And in fact, the power has been transferred into him and he holds all the cards. And I kind of got that sense of that anima quality, you know, this, his inner, inner woman, like a, a a soul counterpart in some way. And um, Mm. we'll go into, you know, my associations with that. But I did, notice one other thing is he'd asked himself several times in the story um, why he didn't speak up or ask questions. And yeah. to me in that final dialogue, he finally, he finally asks the question, why didn't you tell me Carla? Mm-hmm. And I was like, he kind of came out of that Parsifal fool um, thing where, you know, he didn't speak up, didn't ask, mm-hmm. you know, the grail queen, 
asking the question and then he has to go on this journey and finally he he speaks up and asks the question and so some part of that resonated with me um and 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 at that point the betrayal didn't matter the truth mattered more in some way yeah well the the truth and the the not needing the projection the truth mattered more than the projection and all of that stuff. Yeah. That was a beautiful passage, by the way, when he realizes that he's no longer under her power. And it's kind of, it goes back to what you were saying earlier, David, about how the, the lavish descriptions and, you know, how much poetry he heaps onto this figure. Um, I feel like I, I'm just going to read it because it's nice. She laughed and then turned to me and suddenly serious again. Her eyes pale with moonlight, her eyes, the green of water lilies after the rain, her long hair, black as forest river stones, her hair that was like holding the night itself in the wrap of my fingers, her lips starred with incandescent light, lips of camellia petal softness, warmed with secret whispers, beautiful. And I loved her. I loved her still so much, so hard. With, but with no heat or heart at all. The falling love, that helpless, dreaming, soaring love was gone. And I suddenly knew in those seconds of dot, 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 cold adoration, I suppose, that the power she once held over me was also gone. Or more than that, her power had moved into me and had become mine. I held all the cards. And then I wanted to know, I, then I wanted to know. It wasn't good enough to just accept what had happened between us. I wanted to know everything and that gets back to Paul, the point you were raising um, and about the truth being um, imp- more important. I, want, I wonder what would, again, what he was attracted to in her. And maybe it was that coldness. I mean, maybe it was that ability to be aloof and to be clever and to kind of stand a little bit outside the world and to, I have a aura about you, an aura of invincibility or of, um, uh, untouchability. Well, well, this probably says more about me than about the actual meaning of the novel, but my fantasy is, especially after hearing women, more often women than men say, Oh, they fall in love with some guy because, they can save him, right? There's something there that they see that's been heard or, you know, they can heal his heart, you know, from a previous relationship or something. And my fantasy is that he, he's like with um, Khalid Ansari, they recognized her brokenness and, and somehow wanted to um, heal her. I think Khalid also shared that, that desire, like to, you know, wondering if Lynn, did you ever get to her? Did she ever say, I love you? So maybe, maybe Lynn was hoping to, to heal her and heal himself somehow. I'm really interested because I didn't find Carla cold at all. <laughs> maybe it says more about me than <laughs> about her. <laughs> mm. But I think that thread through the whole novel has been really important and um, the mystery of who Carla actually is held a lot together for me. And with that, I'm going to have to say cheerio and thanks heaps. Oh, thank you. Thanks for coming. Bye, Di. Good to see you. Bye, Di. Great. Thanks. <laughs> what a gem. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm so enjoying the, all of your reflections. It's really, it's, uh, it's absolutely making it richer by the minute to reflect and see things a little bit more, if possible, through through your eyes and your mediums. So. I loved her as this mystery, aloof, sort of broken woman. I, I, you know, I thought she was as I was almost as mesmerized as Lynn was by her. <laughs> so I'm totally willing to own that for my character types as a bit of a way of of balancing or taking back the permission I gave myself to be critical of her. The reality for me, if we were to say that when people develop a, you know, a characteristic reaction to life emotionally, you know, uh, we all have slings and arrows. And, and, and if we just playfully said, you know, 
one reaction is to, you know, is, is to break or go soft or as if there was an archetypally feminine melting reaction to be wounded by the travails of life and the hardships versus to get steely, calculating, withdrawn, or, and if I'm not misattributing it, at least playfully for this, for this reflection, more of a masculine direction to rise above it and not be vulnerable to it anymore, to be, you know, superior to it through aloofness and calculation and, you know, staying one step ahead of anyone or you know, whatever. I'm much more, so I'm, I'm no less susceptible to, to the uh, incredible offerings of codependency as a primary attractor with who I fall in love with. But I'm, if I'm prone to try to save anyone, it seemed Lynn was quite intrigued by this, you know, this mysterious whatever. I, you know, I much more lean towards and be drawn towards being um, with someone whose wound is more transparent and obvious and, obvious and vulnerable rather than Carla, who just seemed to be sort of a hyper masculine kind of beauty in her own way. I didn't get juice. I didn't get hips. I got steely night stars, emeralds, hard, you know, I, I didn't get it at all. It felt to me like he was having gay sex. Truly. I didn't get, I didn't get mama river ocean. It wasn't that for me at all. So that's just me. You know, I'm just going off. On the, no, so, and it's I so cool. Actually. <laughs> Hear these just different perspectives. Projections, <laughs> right? Like all right. this comes through. Right. <laughs> it, it's it's just going to mess us up because I'm complicating the stew. But I can't help but let you know I keep thinking about Lisa. Lisa Carter. <laughs> See, there we go. Paul and I would have been fighting over Lisa a couple of the other guys. Absolutely. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm wondering if somebody like Carla is more like a. It's almost more like a drug. She's almost more like a drug to him. And I, I've had this thought too, and this is more of a personal, ref- just coming out of my own experience. That at one time in my life, I sort of had a, a choice between somebody who, at least in my mental world was more like Carla, it was more, more aloof, more intellectual, more uh, just cl- like wise to the world in, in, in a way. And, and someone who was more heart-based, uh, more sort of transparent. And, and I realized that part of me really wanted that first one more, but as I, and, and it wasn't fated to work out. It wasn't going to happen. Uh, even if I'd chosen it in some sense, it, if I had chosen it, I realized it would have been like choosing some kind of drug dependency that would lead into nowhere. It would be almost like choosing her- the heroin, you know, mm-hmm. rather than the kale salad. And you know that the heroin is going to make you feel really good. You know how powerful it is, right? Because it's, but at the heart of it, there's an emptiness. At the heart of it, there's a deadness. And that's even, that's how, exactly how, Lynn describes the, ex- the experience of the progression of, of the addiction is that it just kills you, eviscerates your soul bit by bit, and you lose the light, you lose the gleam. And the kale salad doesn't have the just raw you know, in p- power at first, apparently. Uh, but in the long run, it's actually going to sustain life. It's actually going to be generative. And I wonder if there's some, at least for my life, I, I know that I at one time I had felt like I had that choice to make. And, and I even framed it in those terms for myself. Like, this is a, a drug. It's sexy. It would be awesome. It would be beautiful. But it would be empty versus the – and I, I kind of hear that same sentiment coming through, through you, uh, David. Like, you um, – and, and I see that. And I, uh, I, I liked Carla. Like, I, I, I saw what he – found attractive about her like i i found i would find myself attracted in the same way i mean to me it kind of would have been like these artistic relationships you hear about between like diego rivera frida Kahlo type relationship or uh jean paul sartre and simone de beauvoir like these you know sort of high power like creative intellectual relationships that um 
uh, you know, maybe don't have as much of the tenderness and as much of, or maybe they do, I don't, I don't know, but, but they, they play themselves out on, in um, sort of non, like, like they play themselves out in, in this, this realm of, of, of destructive patterns and of um, this kind of existential abs- absorption. And uh, like, well, I get the sense from, that from Lisa, for example, that she's really kind of come to terms with herself in some fundamental way. She's trying to be healthy. She can love. She does love Lynn. Mm-hmm. And he, he doesn't seem to passionately love her in the way that he loved Carla. But his love for her, his care for her seems to be healthy, actually. Like he, you know, like he's looking out for her. She's looking out for him. They're caring for each other. And I don't know what's going to happen with their relationship. And they still, I guess, are together or part, partly. In the sense together. it's growing, but gently or quietly. Or something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, organically, kind of yeah. like, a, like a seedling. Or, yeah, right, right. Yeah. So those, those are in, very interesting. <laughs> reflections i think hmm. i know there's a, another book i suppose that there's the same characters in mountain shadow i don't know for sure because i haven't opened it up but one of the things i'm liking about the book is just as you said pam the characters we can tell are on a certain trajectory like with lynn or with Lisa and, and even with Carla, like I have hope that she can somehow go find Khalad Ansari and therefore um, caught her by his teacher and maybe have a, you know, spiritual awakening and be made whole. Like there's something about the ways that those are left unfinished that um, my own imagination or whatever uh, can do something with. Mm. And there, to me, I was really appreciative of that at the end. There wasn't a lot of tying together, but um, almost a sense of hope and wonder in these different trajectories. Um, yeah. That's beautifully said. Yeah, that's the first moment I imagine liking her. There's a, a story arc where she goes through some arduous journey that, that uses up all of her steely, self-protective early life strategy of, you know, tougher than and never hurt again. And, and she actually breaks and from that emerges, you know, um, some, some woman who brings the power of that together with actually a reentry into womanhood, um, you know, archetypal woman elements that weren't safe for her since that was so violated as a young person. And, and what a powerful um, woman that would be. So and who knows? Here we, here we are. <laughs> it's too late for us. It's too for, late for us to suggest edits because I see the book on my shelf. So it's apparently here. <laughs> so nobody has started the sequel yet? Is it out? It's out though, right? Yeah. Yeah. Huh. It's, it not out, it's not out in audio form and it's not out in Kindle form. It's you have to actually, you have to get the, uh, the real paper. on this mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll just go ahead and mention the Ganesha in the room then and wonder if we're going to be able to read the <laughs> sequel together. Love that. that my my <laughs> question just now as well. <laughs> That'd be cool. <laughs> yeah. hmm. I would like to read it. I, I, I think I need a little break, and I have some things I want to take care of this summer, but I, I, uh, I think we should talk about it and maybe pick it up a few months couple months maybe yeah. the fall yeah love that yeah it works for me right. let's uh let's let's plant that seed okay. at least. and i can't see how guarantee things... i won't i won't have looked at it by then but i'll be quiet i'll be well behaved as i was <laughs> you have the book don't you yeah i have it right here yeah. i know i remember so i think you showed it during one of our yeah. things it's like oh it's a thing <laughs> So should we offer any closing reflections on uh, like as meta, go meta on meta? Go uh, meta on meta? Yeah. Or go, go, go intimate on meta. <laughs> However you want to do it. You know, um, I, please. Well, I'll just say, you know, I, I, um, my undergraduate degree was in English literature, but mm. I've always been a bit of a literal concrete kind of a person. I remember when we were studying Chaucer 
well, this is in high school, and they're saying, well, the red means blood, and it means all this, and I'd be like, how do you know that's what it means? So this is kind of my framework. And so I've really loved being with you all um, who are able to see more of the, you know, the underlying um, illusions and things like that and, and the, the framework. Um, I tend to be much more of an emotional reader and relational reader myself. You know, it's who do I connect with? Who don't I? And, and you know, and the therapist in me is tracking. You know, like I actually felt a lot of sorrow for Carla you know, because of her background and stuff. And I, I, I actually see myself in her. I had more of that hardened kind of approach because of my own early stuff. So I, I get that, mm -hmm. I mean, to a milder degree. But, um, mm -hmm. but I've loved, um, I'm just feeling grateful, you guys. I just love doing this together. And, you know, part of, I started this because I wanted to get a little bit, I wanted it actually to sort of soften up some with my heart and begin to connect back on a soul level. I've been so task focused. And so this has been a kind of precious, a precious uh, point for me. You know? hmm. so. yeah. Thanks, Pam. I'm so glad that you did it too. That's so cool. Because, you know, Pam, Pam and I actually have been working together for years, like a decade, like yeah. on, but more on web, more on work stuff, like web projects, web design, marketing, business stuff, that kind of a thing. And like, we, you know, we're friends. Like, you know, we hang when she's in town, we hang, we've hung out, John, nice. and I'm over, we've gone for dinner. Uh, but I haven't been in Utah in like 10 years. Uh, and uh, so it was just really cool to be able to kind of step off the um, professional, you know, yeah. kind of side of things and just talk about life. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed it. I don't want to get, I didn't want to get into my own meta reflection, but, uh, just to reflect back on, on your, uh, your sharing, Pam, uh, really appreciate you uh, doing this because yeah, it was really nice just to have totally different points of view. And, yeah. um, and uh yeah and to think about sort of the bigger life patterns and i mean like like the meditation the websites like what are we all doing it for we're doing it to live right we're doing it for you know really so we can show up in life in the way like in a way that like a book like this like i think exemplifies because i mean and i guess to move into my own reflections like what i got from this is just a person who's living so you know like uh, uh, intensely, you know, and so, I mean, of course, it's all concentrated into these pages. So there's, you know, you don't hear everything. There's probably a lot of things that are pretty boring about his life, but like, and and it's not just the fact that he goes to war and that he's in a different country, etc. I mean, it's really his his care and the, how much how observant he is and how alive he is to his own interior life. It's like that Di was saying earlier, his own interior landscape and how sensitive he is to um, the nuances of people's, people's interactions and their faces and their gestures and like what lights them up, like what, what, what do they long for? Like where, what really lights the, what, to, what, light, what opens up their hearts? Like he's so sensitive to all that. And I mean, like you, I'm often, Pam, in the work mode and the professional mode and trying to get things done and project management and money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it just goes on and on. But what I've experienced through reading this book, which I, I get whenever I get in, and there are not too many books that, like this. Seriously, there are not too many books like this in the world that really like let you get so deeply into them and that weave such a such a rich world. Um, uh, but it was always for me a relief to get to read this uh, at night and, and then to talk with you all. Uh, I, I've, um, it's allowed, I think, me and us to, to think about life on life's own terms. Uh, and and uh, I think that's what I love about fiction. That's what I love about, about literature. Uh, and so it was good to get that validated again and to, um, 
you know, to not be alone in it either. <laughs> it's good to, like sometimes I just wanted to be able to talk uh, and uh, the book's kind of an excuse for that. Uh, but then we start talking about the book and you really see how, how it can relate. And the fate piece to me, we didn't talk about that so much. It's something that I feel like I'm going to need to be thinking about a lot, a lot more because it starts there with this idea of fate and the idea that you, you can change your fate and it ends there uh, with the same idea. And uh, with Cutter's re- resolution theory, and the, the idea that, uh, which <laughs> you heard it for the first time, I was like, cool, that sounds pretty cool, resolution theory. I'd like to read a book about that. <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> um, yeah, um, a universe of possibilities. Every human heartbeat is a universe of possibilities. Every human will has the power to transform its fate. I really want to believe that. Uh, I don't know if I always can, but I really want to. That's all I'll say. Well, I'll just say that this um, has been a journey and kind of a passage for me and an invitation through the um, writing uh, to engage life. And um, I think I was, I'd gone into it, you know, kind of, uh, pulling back, focusing on work, uh, simplifying mode, and um, this book uh, and uh, and being able to be with you um, was uh, synchronous with a sense of uh, more vitality and a little more coming back out and engaging and you know uh, getting just out of my office and doing other things with uh, in yeah. groups and with more people, and I felt the book as a as a distinct challenge like a challenge to my heart, a challenge to my will, a challenge to my, my consciousness, a challenge to um, my participation and my capacity to um, uh, love in the world. Like I was kind of felt Lynn is sort of um, as a character and maybe the author um, uh, um, being so intense and everything so vivid that um I felt enjoined, I guess, maybe. And then being able to talk and share and listen and reflect with you, um, that made it all the much richer to be able to share it together. So thank you. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. I just share everyone's gratitude. It's been so nice to get to know, um, especially for those of us for whom this is a new connection. So nice to get to know um, both of you guys. Marco and I are here in Boulder and and we can theoretically meet again. He's made some wonderful offers about how we might unite after this and reflect on the group. But I just welcome um, to any degree degree you feel inspired to to be in contact, um, um, sort of embracing these as new friendships wherever they want to go. And I'm really grateful for the shared journey in this meaningful book. I thought um, we should maybe indulge taking it out with the last couple uh, couple sentences. Uh, in the spirit with which we've done the others. Does that sound good? Mm-hmm. Okay. There we go. Thank you, everyone. I gave the boy back into Parvati's arms and wiped a hand across my face and into my hair, looking at the people, listening to the breathing, heaving, laughing, struggling music of the slum all around me. I remembered one of Kadarbai's favorite phrases. Every human heartbeat, he'd said many times, is a universe of possibilities. And it seemed to me that I finally understood exactly what he'd meant. He'd been trying to tell me that every human will has the power to transform its fate. I'd always thought that fate was something unchangeable, fixed for every one of us at birth and as constant as the circuit of the stars. But I suddenly realized that life is stranger and more beautiful than that. The truth is that no matter what kind of game you find yourself in, no matter how good or bad the luck, you can change your life completely with a single thought or a single act of love. Well, I'm out of practice sleeping on the ground, I said, smiling at Rukmabai. You can have my bed, Kishan offered. Oh, no, you don't, I protested. Oh, yes, I do, he insisted. 
dragging his cot from outside his hut to mine, while Johnny, Vitendra, and the others hugged and mock wrestled me into submission. And our cries and laughter rolled away toward the time dissolving everness of the sea. For this is what we do put one foot forward and then the other. Lift our eyes to the snarl and smile of the world once more. Think, act, feel. Add our little consequence to the tides of good and evil that flood and drain the world. Drag our shadowed crosses into the hope of another night. Push our brave hearts into the promise of a new day. With love. The passionate search for a truth other than our own. With longing. The pure, ineffable yearning to be saved. For so long as fate keeps waiting, we live on. God help us. God forgive us. We live on.